Uh, what the police found um, and try to share some images with you. And I, I have to apologize in advance if you see some weird stuff on the screen as I'm, uh, as I'm doing that. I usually don't have to do the images myself. Um, it's sort of the walking chewing gum thing, which um, can be a strain. Anyway, uh, so I thought I'd start with the crime and then move on to the trial, which is really the focus of the book. Uh, and then I'm I'm happy to talk uh, about any part of the case or the trial or about true crime or historical true crime that's of interest to anyone. Um, I like to leave as much uh, room as possible um, for questions, just because you know it makes a lot more sense to be talking uh, back and forth with with people um, about what they're actually you know really most engaged by. Um, but let me take you uh, back to August 4th, 1892, uh, where the police in uh, Fall River, Massachusetts, discovered this really grisly murder scene. Andrew Borden, who was a prominent local businessman, and his second wife, Abby, were found hacked to death in their home near the city center. It seemed to be the work of a madman. The details were gruesome. First, Abby had been felled by 19 blows in an upstairs guest room. And about a half an hour later, Andrew had received 10 blows as he lay sleeping in the sitting room sofa. His face resembled raw meat. Yet according to one of the first people on the scene, the house itself was an apple pie order. So keep in mind the interval between the two murders, that's going to be very important. And secondly, um, I'll just pause to note that the person who described uh, this, the house as being an apple pie order was not a policeman. One of the things that's so striking from working about the, on the case, especially for such a long time, is uh, the number of times that uh, you know, it appears in diaries or in other, in, in other private papers because it seemed like everybody in the town wandered through the murder site uh, at uh, the time. You know, we, th we think about, um, you know, we're, we're sort of expecting Fall River CSI with everything uh, appropriately um, cordoned off and, uh, and uh, all of the evidence logged. And um, there was a bit of that, but, but it was also, you know, something that was enough of a spectacle that people gathered there was a massive crowd and uh, prominent citizens were able to come in and take a look for themselves. But back to the scene, of, the scene of the actual murders. As the police were looking at this, there seemed to be two key facts that ruled out a murderous stranger. First, the front door and the basement door were locked. So these are the two kind of obvious points of entry, the front door, you know, up a couple of steps to the front door. And the second was the basement door, which went out to the backyard. Um, so that meant that the only apparent or possible entry point for an assassin um, was a side door. Um, those of you who have uh, old New England houses will, will know that um, sometimes people call that the coffin door. It, it, uh, it was by the kitchen. But that was typically latched, you know, just on a little hook and eye. Um, so one, you know, the question is, how did the person get in? And the second was, even if an assassin had found his way inside, then there was the interval between the murders to consider. You know, would someone who'd come in from outside have lingered in the house for an hour and a half after the first murder? of Abby Borden upstairs. Um, and did he know that Andrew Borden would be home? You know, it wasn't necessarily obvious that that would be the case. Um, and it's worth keeping in mind that this was a, a narrow house physically as well as uh, psychologically. There weren't hallways to provide privacy or places for an assassin to hide from the other occupants of the house. Uh, Speaking of the occupants, there were three other people besides the murder victims known to be in the house that morning. 
Andrew Borden's brother-in-law, John Morse, spent the night in the upstairs guest room, which was the scene of the first murder. But he was known to have departed shortly after breakfast, almost an hour before Abby died. Morse had an alibi out of an Agatha Christie novel. He said he had been riding on a horse car with six priests. The conductor didn't remember him, but did remember the priests. Another occupant of the house, Bridget Sullivan, the Borden's housemaid, might have expected to fall under suspicion. She was an Irish immigrant, and according to the prevailing criminological theories of the day, might have been seen as a possible suspect. Um, at the time, uh, the police had a tendency to round up the usual suspects, and those suspects were usually immigrants, and that's where their attention first, first turned. Um, but she had uh, a very good alibi in that she was spotted outside washing windows by the housemaid next door. So that left one remaining suspect in the house, Lizzie Borden, who's pictured here, Andrew's younger daughter. There was another daughter of the house, uh, Emma, who was nine years older than Lizzie, but she was visiting friends in a seaside town called Fairhaven um, and had been out of town at the time of the murders. Now, Lizzie didn't look the part, as you can see from her picture. You know, she's not the sort of person that the police expected to have, be wielding uh, a hatchet or an ax um, and killing her father and her stepmother. But there was something a little bit off. Um, to different people, she gave shifting accounts of her whereabouts during the critical period. She said she had been downstairs ironing handkerchiefs when Abby was killed. Yet strangely, she had not heard a sound. Um, again, this was a small enough house and Abby was a large enough woman that this seemed noteworthy. Uh, just parenthetically, this was a house that had been um, a two family tenement. Uh, and so the upstairs was basically exactly like the downstairs uh, and the rooms just led, uh, opened onto each other. There weren't, there weren't sort of there weren't hallways, um, which was, you know, we would consider part of a normal part of a house. Um, so that meant that um, if Lizzie had been upstairs, she would have had to pass by the open door of the guest uh, bedroom uh, where Abby's body lay before, as she was descending the stairs. And if she had been downstairs, she would have been almost directly underneath where the murders, the, mur the first murder had happened. Uh, and in fact, according to the housemaid, uh, Bridget, Lizzie was in fact descending the stairs um, and could have seen into the guest room um, when her father returned about 1045 that morning. After greeting her father, Lizzie said um, that her stepmother had received a note and had gone out. Uh, and this was unusual. This wasn't something her stepmother usually did, but the idea was that it was a note to see a sick friend. Uh, Andrew apparently accepted it. And Lizzie said that after her father went in to go take a nap, um, she resumed her ironing, but again, suspended her work and walked outside to the barn in search of a sinker, a weight for a fishing line, or perhaps a piece of lead to fix a screen. And there in the upstairs of the uh, barn, she tarried enjoying a few pears picked from the backyard trees. Upon discovering her father's body, she had not looked for her stepmother because she, as she had told her father before he died, that Abby had received a note. It should be noted that this note was never found. Um, later, after the doctor um, who examined her father's body uh, left to send a telegram to her older sister who, who was out of town. Um, she volunteered that perhaps she had indeed heard Abby come in and this spurred the belated discovery of Abby's body upstairs. Further investigation disclosed a motive. The Borden household was the site of a cold war between the generations. 
Andrew Borden was a rich man who could claim descent from one of the founding families of Fall River. Uh, but he was a self-made man and he was known to have been a miser, eschewing life in the elite residential district known as the Hill and more interested, as a contemporary journalist put it, in piling up dollars than in spending his fortune. Uh, one thing that I think is very striking if you actually visit Fall River is that uh, the topography of the town, um, if you're imagining it as, a, you know, as it was in the Victorian era, essentially mirrors the social structure of the town. So that the poorer you are, the lower you live, the richer you are, the higher you live. So there's this elite residential district in the hill, um, which is somewhere that the, uh, the Borden daughters might have aspired to live based on their father's wealth. Uh, there's the flats where the Bordens actually lived, which was considered to be um, a middle-class district, a district for professionals like the doctors who lived around the Bordens. Um, and was pretty handy for, for uh, Andrew Borden, who liked to walk into town and collect his own rents and check on his buildings. Um, and then there was the, you know, there was the, um, the lowest in terms of geography part of the part of the town closest to the river, which is where the, the mills were, and also um, where people who worked in the mills tend, tended to live in more crowded conditions. Anyway, I think it's, you know, it's useful to have that picture as you're thinking about, um, as you're thinking about the case. Uh, Lizzie and Emma um, were said to have resented their father's straightened manner of living and were outraged when he bought a house in his wife's name for the benefit of Abby's half sister. What he did for her, they thought he could do for his own blood. He gave his daughters a comparable property, but it didn't heal the rift. Lizzie and Emma conducted their lives as separately as was possible in a small house, receiving their visitors upstairs and avoiding meals with their father and stepmother. In contrast to her demure older sister, Lizzie was famously forthright and openly disdainful of her stepmother. Shortly after the bodies were discovered, Lizzie tartly corrected the police officer interviewing her, stating of Abby, she is not my mother. There was other evidence uh, linking Lizzie to the crime. Three men in a local drugstore identified her as the woman who tried to buy prussic acid the day before the murders. Prussic acid is a diluted form of hydrocyanic acid a deadly poison that was sold only upon doctor's prescriptions. Now poison, unlike a hatchet, was a woman's weapon and Lizzie's inability to procure it seemed to explain why a well-bred young woman would pick up a man's weapon and commit the murders in such a bloody fashion. The lack of blood on Lizzie Borden or on any of her clothes seemed an insoluble conundrum until her friend Alice Russell came forward to testify that Lizzie had burned a dress the Sunday after the murders, a dress Lizzie said had been stained with paint. And just getting ahead a little bit, I should say that there is evidence that it was stained with paint. Uh, both the painter and the dressmaker testified eventually at a trial that, um, that there was paint on this dress and it was an old dress, um, but it doesn't rule out the idea that there might've been something else on the dress. Anyway, given this background of circumstantial evidence, it looked pretty dark for Lizzie Borden. Um, the family lawyer uh, knew he was in trouble. And so he retained the services of two extremely eminent trial lawyers. Uh, one, um, a sort of flamboyant uh, Boston lawyer named uh, Melvin Adams, who was um, noted for uh, his skill in uh, dealing with the expert testimony and also was apparently a bit vain about his looks. And the second, um, and probably most significant in the case in terms of the outcome, 
was the former governor of Massachusetts, uh, George Robinson. And he was uh, a really folksy guy with the common touch. Uh, and he had a manner of being able to, um, you know, talk with the jurors as if, as if he was just stopping by uh, to chat, you know, as opposed to, as opposed to the, the formal uh, manner of the state's attorneys. Uh, and they were excellent um, lawyers as well. And I should say that speaking as um, someone who's a lawyer or a recovering lawyer in any event, um, that was part of what attracted me to the case was the quality of the, um, the legal professionals that makes it you know, quite a battle. So just to give you a sense of what uh, the trial itself was like, I, I mean, the closest analogy, at least in my lifetime, um, is the O.J. Simpson case. Uh, I'm from Los Angeles, um, though I was not um, in L.A. at the, at the time of, the, of that trial. Uh, but of course, as we, you know, as most of us would remember, you didn't have to be because it was a, it was an event that was, was covered by um, both local journalists and also by national news, international news, all dispatched to get everything from local color background um, to, you know, to the point that, that it, it seemed like there was, there was no part of it that wasn't um, being disseminated. Uh, and although, uh, you know, this was, this is well before um, not just television, but also radio, uh, there was an equivalent of Camp OJ uh, set up in the New Bedford courthouse, which is where the trial ended up taking place. And the best um, and most famous correspondents from uh, around New England in particular, but the country in general, uh, came and reported on the case and they themselves become part of the story. And if you uh, decide to read the book, um, which I hope you do, um, you'll see that I used um, their accounts, the sort of the color commentary that they provide uh, to give life to the courtroom scenes. Because although, you know, I'm, I'm interested enough in the case that, that the transcript was sufficient for me, to see the sorts of, you know, what evidence comes in, what evidence gets, gets kept out and why, um, to get a sense of what it was actually like in the courtroom and the tension and the, what the audience was like. Those are things that, you know, you need, you need these journalistic accounts. And I found them kind of indis indispensable and also them as very appealing characters and really interesting characters in their own right. Um, and although there were no women on the jury, um, Parenthetically, like women didn't serve on the jury in Massachusetts until 1950, if you can imagine. Uh, there were women reporters and they tended to claim, you know, as if they had some sort of special empathetic access to her, uh, that they understood her better. Um, and it is true that they had a better sense maybe of the significance of things uh, like, as you can see on the screen, the little pansy pin um, or the quality of the clothing or the care with which um, she uh, dressed her hair um, before court every day. Um, and in fact, uh, when there was a break, she'd often, she'd often recurl a little piece of hair uh, so that she'd have a proper ringlet. Um, One of the things that puzzled people was Lizzie Borden herself, you know, and I'm, I'm sort of keeping this image up because uh, she, this is one that I think is like a particularly enigmatic photo of her. Uh, and part of it is the, you know, the way photos were taken that someone, you know, they have to kind of stare off into the distance, but there is something that um, that's quite compelling, but, but also, you know, a little bit hard to fathom. Uh, but the reporters found her sort of a disappointment. You know, one observed with apparent surprise that she is in truth a very plain looking old maid. She may have be likened to a typical school marm, plain, practical, and with a face that shows deep lines of either care or habitual low spirits. There is nothing wicked or criminal or hard in her features. Um, and this is significant, you know, because 
because obviously they're trying to read the physiognomy and to see to see if there's something that makes it more likely she would have done something like this. Uh, and that wasn't just you know light interest. There was um, there were criminological theories underlying that search. The idea that that um, that certain kinds of criminality would actually be written on the face. One of the things that um, one of the women uh, reporters noted was that uh, every picture that has been made of this woman either absurdly flat and flatters her or grossly maligns her. Um, you know, so in other words, depending on whether the people really thought she was guilty or innocent, um, they tend to depict her or describe her in ways that were consistent to, with that. Um, she was just sort of unremarkable in lots of ways. Um, one reporter said that she is in fact neither large nor small nor tall nor short, but is of average build and in demeanor is quiet, modest and well-bred. More than that, there was, uh, he concluded about her that indefinable quality, which we call ladyhood. So, which gives you a, I think a sense of uh, the class dynamics at, at play. Um, this is someone who is ticking or checking all the boxes of proper middle-class respectability for women. Uh, it is true that she was uh, not married, which is unusual um, or, or out of the ordinary for um, that era, but um, there was a, a socially sanctioned role she could play as uh, someone of her class with some leisure time who could uh, do good work. She was a member of the Ladies Fruit and Flower Mission, um, the, late, the Christian Endeavor Society, uh, the WCTU, um, all the kind of good work she would expect of someone like her. And in fact, the focus of her charitable and really, you, I guess you could say any of her outside the home activities were, were her church. And uh, the church backed her heavily during the trial. The, the, uh, the minister uh, sat in the courtroom with her every day to show his support. Um, what people found most striking though, beyond the, her appearance was this extraordinary self-possession, something that, um, something that, that, you know, that they could read either way, you know, either it is as the reporter I just quoted um, said, some sort of sign of ladyhood, you know, a marker of, of true American grit that she is the, she is exactly what she appears and therefore must be innocent. Or there's something unsettling, something sort of calculating, almost masculine in that uh, ability to be so unmoved by the drama around her, to be able to sit with such composure as all these horrible things um, are being uh, described. Um, In addition to, to Lizzie Borden, the, the, uh, a lot of fascination or about the trial turned on the, the audience. Um, there was, as I said, no, there, were, there were, as I said, no women on the jury, um, but there was this sort of self-constituted second jury of women um, who were regular attendees. Uh, these tickets were really hard to come by. The people queued for hours, sort of like it was a big concert uh, and people brought, brought picnic lunches uh, and sat on the steps um, of the houses near that surrounded the courthouse. I mean, it was sort of the the happening on the on the scale of the um, world fair world fair that was going to open in Chicago later that year. Um, and the the uh, papers, you know, despite stoking all the interest in the trial, you know, note this ruefully um, under the heading where to look for your wife, the Fall River Daily Globe advised, the New Bedford man who comes home and finds it deserted needn't be alarmed. There has been no elopement. The dear creature is probably in the crowd of morbid females who are storming the door of the court county, the county courthouse trying to get admission to the Borden house. Um, 
and what was significant too was that was that the the uh, as one journalist put it that there was a mix of uh, calico and silk. In other words, um, women of all uh, social classes um, were inspired to try to attend uh, the trial. Um, and the other thing that I found interesting about it is that is that. Uh, you know, it's pretty clear to me that they're a lot less sympathetic towards Lizzie Borden than the reporters. Uh, the reporters start out being, um, I guess you'd say, you know, more in the neutral manner uh, where they're just sort of observing um, and they find it hard to believe, but they're, you know, they, they seem increasingly as the case goes by won over by Lizzie Borden. Uh, but, the women in the in the um, in the audience seem a lot more skeptical. You know whether it's just that they're horrified that somebody um, see, that someone like Lizzie Borden, someone like them, has transcended uh, the transcended their their supposed capacity as well as um, as well as done something you know so horrible, uh, but. That you know that that's something that the the you know becomes as much a part of the story itself. Um, the defense's main argument in the trial is that you know really they don't have to solve the mystery, um, and that uh, excuse me while I try to um, swap these pictures. That um, this gives you a a sense of how the defense portrayed. Uh, portrayed the same, um, that, uh, you know, Lizzie Borden was just doing what you would expect a woman to do. She was, she had no alibi because she was in her own home doing the things that people like Lizzie Borden would do, you know, a little bit of ironing, a little bit of sewing, a little bit of searching for a sinker if you, if she imagined she was going to go fishing, uh, that these were all perfectly normal things and that and for someone like her, with a certain amount of leisure, but not, um, you know, not a huge number of social responsibilities, that you know, one day was sort of much like another, and that it wasn't that surprising that she she couldn't really account for her time in the way that um, a purposeful, busy man um, of the same class might have been able to do. Uh, and this gives. Um, this cartoon gives you a sense too of the other tack the defense took, which was that that you know really that the police were just out of their league and that they had to fasten on a suspect because it was such a horrible crime and everybody was worried and upset uh, that you know an elderly couple could be killed you know on a on an otherwise ordinary Thursday morning in August. Um, and so they were under a lot of pressure to find a culprit. And Lizzie Borden just happened to present them with a, with an easy enough target. Uh, and this also sort of specifically refers to this question um, of the murder weapon, which was never conclusively identified. There were a number of um, hatchets and axes in the Borden household. And there is one in particular uh, that's referred to as the handleless hatchet. Um, or as one of the newspapers put it, the hoodoo hatchet, uh, because it appears and disappears, uh, that that was probably the murder weapon. And the fact that it wasn't found was something that the prosecution argues, um, or at least wasn't found right by the bodies, is something that the prosecution argues um, pointed towards an insider being the culprit, because an outsider would hardly have uh, taken a bloody hatchet with him, you know, to sneak outside. Um, the prosecution's argument is uh, is really that Lizzie Borden is the only person with exclusive opportunity to commit the murders. And she also had a motive, which was this long uh, standing hatred of her stepmother. And so as you won't have trouble um, imagining, uh, that still left them with the very difficult question of why would she kill her father? You know, pretty much everyone seemed to understand, you know, whether it's because of fairy tales or just a sense of um, human psychology, that there might be 
resentment on the part of a stepdaughter um, towards her stepmother, particularly when there are, you know, there are these other issues. Um, for example, the dispute over property and this worry that the money was leaving their household um, and going into her stepmother's family. But the idea that she would then kill her father just seemed fairly uh, incredible. And the prosecution has to come up with, a, with an explanation for that. And it's pretty unsatisfactory um, from a, a psychological point of view. It's simply that she planned to kill the stepmother and then her father came home earlier than was expected. And therefore um, she was forced to kill him as well. Uh, and it, it adds the dimension of the, the idea that she would not want her father to know that she had killed her stepmother and somehow that then that that would mean that it would be preferable to kill him than to have him know that she had committed a murder. Um, of course, they don't have to. They don't have to prove why. They just have to prove that um, she did it. And I'm leaving out a lot of um, some of the things that that are most exciting about the case, namely the the murder weapon, uh, the lack of blood, uh, the pail of bloody towels found that were decided to be menstrual cloths in the basement, um, Lizzie Borden's attempt to buy poison, uh, allegedly, um, which is something that gets excluded from trial. Her inquest testimony, which is the source of the inconsistent statements about where she was during the day that also gets excluded from the trial. I mean, these are all, uh, I think fascinating parts of the of the case that tell us a lot about um, what that era thought about women and criminality. Because in making those decisions uh, about whether or not this kind of evidence goes in or not, um, the judges have to make the calculation about well, what's what's really relevant um, and is probative but isn't going to be something that's sort of unduly prejudicial for the jury. So it was, a, it was an unusually long trial for the era. Um, it, you know, it lasted over two weeks. Uh, the closing arguments um, uh, you know, were, were also extended. The, um, the, and I, I guess I think what what struck me is that there was a great deal of um, suspense, you know, both both um, in the public's mind, um, as indicated by the newspaper coverage, uh, and also on the part of the lawyers. I think that um, the prosecution once the once the their best evidence, namely the evidence of Lizzie Borden's um, own words from her own mouth um, are excluded and the evidence of her attempt to buy the prussic acid, which is would suggest um, intent. Um, once those are once those are ruled out, then it does seem like the prosecution a little bit gives up um, it's, I wouldn't say hope, but at least not, it's, um, it's much less confident. Um, and the defense certainly breathes a sigh of relief. But it's not at all clear which way the case is going to go. Um, and the assumption is that the jury will be out for some time. Uh, but instead, they come back so quickly that the judges have to be recalled. They're, um, they just go out for a little walk to get some air. Um, the three judges in Massachusetts, because it's a capital case. This is just a little technical legal point. Um, and uh, we discover later that the jurors were actually unanimous on the first ballot, but that they stayed there um, in the room for longer just because they wanted to have the appearance of being deliberative and out of respect for the prosecution. So 
After this unusually long trial, this hard fought trial, um, Lizzie Borden is um, pronounced not guilty. Uh, there is a cheer in the courtroom. There is an answering cheer outside in the crowd after you know a short delay. Um, and one of the um, set of reporters had figured out that they could um, they they play around with with various ways to signal the outside so that people could get a scoop. Uh, and this is widely viewed to be the right outcome. Uh, there seems to be general relief, uh, both because there are some problems with the case uh, and also because um, I think just the idea of um, her committing those kinds of murders is uh, extremely upsetting to people. I think that they'd rather, well, here's the jury. I'll let you look for yourself. Um, uh, and the significance of this particular picture is that um, after they're sequestered, whoops, I think I'm blocking some jurors here, um, is that after they're, uh, you know, after they're released, uh, they go to the hotel bar where they have a drink <laughs> because they've had to um, have nothing but uh, filtered water and other um, soft drinks uh, during the time of their trial while they've been sequestered, but um, they send a picture, this particular picture to Lizzie Borden herself. Um, and she writes each of the jurors uh, a, a, a note of thank you as her, you know, friend and friends and deliverers. So at the moment of the acquittal and immediately after this seems to be, um, a widely celebrated verdict, um, but it does split the population of Fall River. Uh, there was always a sense among the less well-to-do in Fall River that um, that she was someone who was getting special treatment because of her uh, status, and that if um, you know it had been a mill hand who was suspected, that that person would have been arrested immediately and not you know not given all sorts of special treatment. There's also the problem too, uh, once Lizzie Borden returns to Fall River, uh, as to you know, how she's going to spend her time. And the assumption is that she and her sister are going to live quietly, uh, that she's going to essentially live down her notoriety. Um, and instead, she lives it up. She and her sister buy uh, the equivalent of a McMansion and the highest point of the uh, Hill District of Fall River. So in other words, the, she ends up with the large house on the hill um, to which she had supposedly as, aspired during her father's lifetime. Uh, and then she's given the message pretty quickly that she's no longer welcome at the church that had provided the bedrock of her support during the trial. Uh, the pews are empty around her, uh, and she shortly afterwards um, pretty much drops all of those activities uh, and instead does some traveling, uh, takes, um, uh, takes trips to Boston and other places to go to the theater, um, starts to pal around with an actress um, who's got a bit of a sketchy rep reputation. Uh, there are all sorts of other scandals very minor, like um, town gossip kind of, sort of scandals. But the point is she's not comporting herself um, with the dignity uh, that the townspeople apparently expect. Uh, and as a result, though we don't know the specific reason, um, her sister, Emma, who had been her great supporter, um, instead uh, decides, oops, I'll, I'll take you back to Lizzie here. <clears throat> uh, moves out in 1905. So that's 12 years after the acquittal. Uh, and then the sisters never speak to each other again. Now, I should say that there's nothing um, to suggest that Lizzie Borden um, suffered deeply uh, because of what you could see as her social ostracism by the town. She chose to remain there 
despite the fact that she could have lived somewhere else uh, in comfort and with a lot less um, exposure. Uh, she could have lived more anonymously elsewhere. Um, but I do think it says something about um, her character, her, her, um, the self-possession that was evident in the trial, the toughness that was evident in the trial, uh, that she chose to remain there. Um, and I suppose it can also speak to her provincialism that for her, there was really no other place that she wanted to be, that it was the Hill District of Fall River um, or the Hill, um, the Hill District of Fall River that was her highest aspiration. Uh, and she spent the remainder of her days uh, <laughs> driving around in a, um, or rather being driven around in a chauffeur chauffeured uh, with a special seat for her dog so they could um, so they could look out the window. Uh, and then she and her sister um, both die in 1927, very close uh, in time, having never spoken. And the entire family is then uh, reunited in the Oak Grove Cemetery. Um, Abby, Andrew, um, the daughter's first mother, Sarah, Emma, Lizzie, uh, and a, a sister who didn't survive infancy. And they're all um, in pretty tight quarters in Oak Grove. But one of the, um, the questions that I'm often asked, and then I'll open it up to actual questions, is, the, is you know, whether with the, with the evidence that had been ruled out, you know, ha had the jury heard the evidence of her attempt to buy poison, um, or had had the inquest testimony admitted, or if the um, prosecution had been stronger in some other sense, um, would that have made a difference? And um, I would suggest that this really isn't a case about reasonable doubt. Although as a juror, I could imagine having reasonable doubt with the case as it was presented, um, that this was instead a case of unreasoning unreasonable certainty that a woman like Lizzie Borden could not have committed um, murders like this, uh, that, that she simply couldn't have done it. It was not a question of, of did she or didn't she, but that it was just simply impossible to contemplate and, and too upsetting um, to everyone's self-conception. And so with that, I think I'd like to um, let people ha ask any questions that they'd like to. I'm happy to um, talk about whatever part of the case you're interested in, if there is any part. And um, I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>